Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Decision Hour. I'm your host, Adam Bird, and folks, <laughs> sit down and buckle in because we got a great one for you today. Uh, super excited and honored to have this gentleman uh, joining us today. He's the co-founder and president of First Star, and he's the CEO of Film Co. Media, LLC. He is a producer, an educator, a social pro, serial pro social entrepreneur, a media executive, and a philanthropist. In 1982, he co-founded the Starlight Children's Foundation. By 1990, the positive psychological impact of Starlight seeded his next pro-social endeavor, Star, Bright, Star Bright World. I can't talk today. Star Bright World, which he co-founded with Steven Spielberg. In 1999, he saw the formation of the first star. In 2005, Edar, everyone deserves a roof. And in 2013, he launched Aspire, the Academy of for Social Purpose and Responsible Entertainment. In the midst of all this, he's also produced 26 films, raised four kids, has been educated at Cambridge and Anderson School of Management at UCLA. He lives in Los Angeles with his wife, and he continues to fight every day for those that are less fortunate than us. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Peter Samuelson. Sir, how are you? So well, thank you, and happy to be with you. Well, I appreciate your time, sir. Um, for those that don't know, if you could just dive in a little bit about yourself uh, and, and really kind of what started you on this endeavor of all of these outstanding charities that you've started. Well... I would say that um, my first big pivot was at 15 years old. I had this teacher called Mr. Lund, and Mr. Lund said, see me after school. And he said, uh, you know, if you worked about twice as hard, you could go to college. You could go to a really good university. And I said, I'm sure I can't. No one in my entire family has ever been to university, not one. And he said, oh, well, then it'll be even better, won't it? Because you'll be the first one. So I did what he said. I got a full ride to Cambridge, which was a good thing because I wouldn't have been able to afford to go otherwise. And the second big pivot is that on the back of um, getting my master's there, um, I emigrated to America. So I'm part of this um, you know, the huddled masses yearning yeah. to be free. Okay. Uh, and I thought that this thing called the American dream was uh, terrific. So if I work hard, I can have a life and can earn money and, you know, build a family and have a career and all those good things, all of which has come true. I think the part of the American dream that we don't often focus upon is that it gives you a crushing debt, an obligation to do well by America. Right. And I can absolutely say that, you know, alongside making money and producing films and all the rest of it and running a company, my five nonprofits are entirely because I feel an obligation to the country that let me in to give back to that country and to apply, a, you know, a bit of whatever I know how to do. Um, identify a big social challenge, and then, you know, get off your derriere and do something about it. And that's what I've done. Starlight, Starbright, First Star, EDAR, Aspire. And it, it's unbelievable because going through these the last several days and just looking at all these organizations, I want to start with, uh, with Starlight here. Um, deliver happiness because happy kids heal faster. Talk a little bit about that. How did that start? What was the... The, the key opponent on that, you saw something and said, hey, let's do this. So um, I met a dying child. He was British. My cousin had met him and she had foolhardy. She had asked him, what would make you really happy, Sean? And 11-year-old Sean said, oh, that's easy. I want to go to Disneyland. And like all other 11-year-old kids, uh, she had no clue how to do that and phoned me. I already lived in America. And I said, well, we can't not do it. You know, you promised him. Right. So we flew him and his mom to the United States. Um, 
everyone moved into my apartment, the cousin, the mum, uh, and, and the little boy, and we spent two weeks doing what you probably should not do with a dying child. Um, we went on the beach. We took him not just to Disneyland, but Knott's Berry Farm. We, um, um, he went up in a helicopter, all sorts of amazing things. He went home, and a few weeks later, he passed away. We, it was very strange. Um, in one sense, it was very sad because, you know, he lived in my apartment right. and we, we came to know each other. Um, in another sense, it wasn't sad because we knew and he knew that he was going to die. Right. And what we were left with was this sort of strange sense that we had done something colossally important. We had not just, you know, made him happy and we actually saw him laugh. But what we had done for the mom, Brenda, she saw him laugh. So her last memories of her kid were not sitting on the edge of a hospital bed and he stops breathing. But, you know, him laughing on the teacups at Disneyland and all that kind of thing. So I, this went around in my mind and I like doing things. Film producers are good at taking an idea and actually not just musing about it, but doing something to address it. Right. So I called a meeting after work and I said to, I don't know, 10 or 12 people, you know, there must be other ill kids in hospitals and maybe two, three times a year we could, you know, ask them what would make them happy and then just do it. We didn't really have any other agenda. We started noticing that there would be occasions where the child's physical illness would seem to be affected by the wish. So like we'd say, Billy, you can't go to Disney World because Dr. Smith says, you know, your T-cell count is too low. And then people would be incredulous and say, oh, look, the T-cell count rose. Uh, and we'd send Billy to Disney World and that was grand. And then we, we would say, don't tell anybody. They'll think we're like, you know, from cuckoo land. They'll think we're like Shirley MacLaine and laying pyramids and crystals. And so we would not talk about it. And then they invented an entire new field of medical research called psychoneuroimmunology. Right. And it's not rocket science. It right. simply says the human mind and the human body interrelate to each other. A clinically depressed person has a suppressed immune system. And a person with a suppressed immune system is often, not always, but often clinically depressed. It's a circle. So actually, if you can make a seriously ill human uh, happier, you are helping the doctors, not with all illnesses, but anything related to the immune system, um, you're, you're giving them a helping hand. And that's the basis of Starlight. You're really kind of providing that positivity, the shining the light, the, 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 the starlight, as you put it, the starlight into their lives to provide that positivity even if it, if it only makes them feel a little better, like you said, because obviously with all, all, all uh, diseases and whatnot, it might not, but, but making somebody smile, it's, it's, it's amazing. Just putting a smile, especially on a child's face. That's priceless. We, 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 we learned and have learned and continue to learn so much from the kids. And we've now broadened out. Starlight is this great big gigantic, thing it's a non-profit in the united states canada australia and the uk um you know uh, somebody on staff went back in the accounting department added up all the money we had ever raised in all of that what is it 35 36 years it's over a billion dollars a thousand million dollars which is the work of so many volunteers so many amazing staff people um it got very big because it's the power of a big idea, which is you're supposed to, as a film producer, be able to say, is this idea big enough, bold enough, new enough, exciting enough, passionate enough, empathic enough that I'm going to take 18 months of my life and, and, and I'm going to make this into a film. It's the same toolkit to look at um, a huge social need. Kids are sad. That's not good for them. Um, 
or, or you know, foster kids don't go to college. Isn't that crazy? Right. Or why are there old ladies and small children sleeping on a sheet of cardboard packing box right. on a rainy night on a sidewalk? What the hell does that make us? Um, so I've tried to take that toolkit, you know, well, what do we do? Where's the money going to come from? Who's the team? What's the solution? How do we do it? How do we build this thing? That's kind of what I do. We, so I'm, I kind of want to back up, Peter, for a second, if I can. How, how did you get into f to f the film business? How, how did that it, – was that something like when you were younger, that's what you wanted to go – and then you well, realized so, you were going to school, and then it's like, hey, I want to do that? Or Well, it's sort of a weird – one of these – so many – wonderful things have kind of fallen on my head where I've just had to say, oh, thank you very much and kind of go with it and something great has happened. So age 18, I finished high school and I got my scholarship to Cambridge. And Cambridge does an amazing thing. They say, congratulations on your scholarship. It's January. Do not come to this university until October. So you are forced to take a gap year. And I met a man who said, so do I understand? He was an American film producer, a guy called Bob Relier. And he said, so do I understand you speak French? And I, you know, fibbed a little bit. I said, I do. I, what I should have said is, yeah, but mostly medieval French, because that's what I've focused on. Um, I didn't. I said, oh, yeah, I'm completely bilingual. He said, oh, well, that's really good, because I'm Steve McQueen's partner. <laughs> And uh, I'm actually flying next week over to Le Mans, France, because we're going to make a motor racing film. And I need someone for the next 10 months as the unit interpreter. And I said, I'm, I'm your man. Uh, <laughs> you know, I travel light. Uh, take me. And that was my first experience of working on a film. And, of course, it's great being the interpreter. Right. First of all, you have this little bit of power. You're the only person who can understand everybody. Right. But secondly, you keep being dragged off to some, you know, the art department needs the interpreter. The, the, the cinematographer needs the interpreter. So you're dragged off uh, all over the place. And I learned the business starting on that film. And then I carried on through my college years. I would, uh, you know, get hired to run off to Paris to do three days of interpreting, that kind of thing. And then after Cambridge, um, an American producer that I worked with actually on some commercials for Chevron in Morocco. He said, do you want to come back to America? Come back to America and you can look at, you know, how we edit and what is a movie Ola and all that good stuff. And mm -hmm. I thought, what the hell? That's fantastic. I said, where is your office? He said, it's on the corner of Hollywood and Vine. And I said, goodness, I've even heard of that yeah, I would love to come and work with you. And that was my first little foray into America. And at a certain point, like sort of five, six years later, I thought, you know, I, I sort of feel as though I live here and I'm sick of having half of my clothes in, in London and the other half in Los Angeles. So I moved everything to LA and I applied for citizenship. And I thought it would just be a formality. They had gotten a backlog and I went down to the convention center and they swore in 2,500 new citizens all at once. We all got a little stars and stripes to wave. And they showed us, you know, amber fields of grain on the video. Yeah. And the, I, the whole thing was so moving. It was nothing for me to come from England to America. You know, you can argue they're both OK countries, but there were people who were weeping who had escaped in shark infested water in an inner tube and who had climbed over the Berlin wall being shot at oh. by the guards. And um, I sort of felt this American dream thing, this American experiment that we have, that's, you know, 200 and odd years old. Um, it's remarkable. It's the best there is. Everybody throws rocks at our country and, Unfortunately, we throw rocks at each other too often, but it is by far the best that there is. And I do feel this sort of burden, this obligation um, to give back. So, you know, to the best of my ability, that's what I've done. Well, 
my hat's off to you. And as a, as a, as a veteran of this, this great land of ours, it's, it's definitely something that we fight for and it's something that I still hold true to even today. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I love it. I, I absolutely love it. Um, thank you for, for that. I want to move, I want to move into that because I, I, with the background, you coming here and how you got into film, your purpose is clear. You clearly have a big heart and, and that is, that is obvious and you can hear it in your voice and just how you explain. And we've only gone over one of the, one of the organizations so far. I want to move it next into Starbright, uh, Starbright world, excuse me, star, uh, Starbright world, uh, with Steven, a gentleman by the name of Steven Spielberg. How, like, how did that transpire? So somebody introduced, somebody got me a meeting with Steven. Okay. And, um, you know, everything is done to make you frightened as you're going in. The second assistant assistant says, uh, don't give Mr. Spielberg your collateral materials. Leave them with me. You've got 12 minutes. He has an ambassador arriving on the hour. You'll have to be gone by then. And there you are. And you're suddenly <laughs> in a room with Steven Spielberg. And it's like surreal because you look at him and you think, damn, this man looks exactly like Steven Spielberg. Oh, wait, <laughs> this is Steven Spielberg. So I I sort of pitched him this idea. I said, you know, we, we're serving thousands of seriously ill kids, um, and I kind of think we could link them together. When they're immunosuppressed, they are, you know, snatched away from their families, and they're, you know, in an airtight, positive airflow room, and they can't be touched by anybody and they get damn lonely. And, you know, there's this new thing um, called the internet. Um, and um, um, I think we could link them together. And he said, well, of course we should do that. And um, they had told me I'd have 12 minutes and I'm looking at my watch and I'm thinking, Ooh, this is going really well. I've been here 40 minutes. Wow. I've been here over an hour wow, that's an hour and a half. And after a little more than an hour and a half, he said, okay, I'm in. What do you want me to do? And I said, right, it's a new nonprofit. It's called Starbright. Um, we'll have to raise money and we're going to do this thing. And he said, what do you want me to be? And I said, you're the chairman. And um, uh, you, you, I'll write the letters and you sign them and we'll put a board together and we'll just do it. And as I, I got a hug, and as I was leaving his office, he's an amazing man. He said to me, listen, if we're going to ask people for money, I think I should give money, shouldn't I? You can't ask people if you don't do it yourself. And people know I've got money. I should give money. What do you think I should give? And I said, oh, I'm not going to. God didn't put me on the earth to tell <laughs> Steven Spielberg what he should give to charity. You give. I said, why don't you give something moderately painful? And he said, no, 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 give me a number. I said, I'm not going to give you a number. He said, you can't leave unless you give me a number. I have no, I had like an out of body experience. I saw my mouth say to Steven Spielberg, I don't know, two, two and a half million dollars. And I saw his mouth say, okay. And actually it was so staggering and it was so sort of, you know, my heart was pumping. I, I could have fallen over with a cardiac attack. So I went out and I went behind a tree and I phoned my wife and I said, I think I'm hallucinating. I think I just had a meeting with Steven Spielberg. It's going to be a new charity and he's donating two and a half million dollars. Oh my God. Oh my God. To which my wife said, where are you? And I said, I'm at Amblin. It's on the lot of Universal Studios. She said, you wait right there. I'm going to come and get you. You do not sound safe to drive to me. And she <laughs> came and got me. And that was the beginning of Starbright World. And we actually did it. When we started linking hospitals together right. so that the kids could communicate and see each other and navigate their avatars, it was so early we had to have people come with a little truck and dig a trench to put broadband cable into the hospital because oh, wow. all they had was, a, you know, a red phone wire with a green phone wire and you couldn't do broadband down that. So we were we had trench diggers and we put this amazing consortium. When you have a new idea and it has 
empathy to it. You can tell a story about it, and suddenly you've got Intel, Sprint, um, Knowledge Adventure, all sorts of big companies uh, that say, yeah, we could do this, and can our staff volunteer, and can they wear T-shirts, and can we do this? And suddenly you're kind of putting on a show because you've identified um, people who need help, and there's a lot of it going on now you know, with the COVID and whatnot and the recession. And um, if you can create empathy and tell the story of something positive that a person can help with, almost everyone will help. And it's one of the redeeming things about human beings, the extent to which, you know, it's not like being in the military and risking your life but almost everyone will put themselves out right. and wants to do something for our common social fabric. And even though, you know, our country has been torn apart and everything's, you know, all the politicians yell at each other and so forth, the actual people of this country all volunteer together. Right. Volunteering is where people leave their politics outside in the car and come in and pack uh, food baskets or whatever it is. I, I, you know, I, I'd like to see more of the media focusing on the positive stories that are out there as opposed to the, I'll say, not so positive stories that are being told. Yeah, you know, abs ab absolutely. Yeah. And there is so much that is positive, and it is the stuff that we have in common. The, yeah, and right. that's what. So that's the missed trick. Right. Is if you if you would talk about the positive stuff, it's where people come together. Yeah. And we need more of that instead of which, you know, it's 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 completely mad. What what we have different television channels depending on what people vote for or and believe, you don't hear right. from the other one and nobody listens to each other. We need more volunteering because yeah. that's where everybody stands there and packs those food packets or whatever it may be. Um, you know, there, there are no political people in working for dying children in starlight. There are only people who are trying to help dying children. Right. You know, it'd be amazing that if people just put the politics aside and come together, like you're saying, to volunteer, how much better this world would be as a whole right now. Yeah. Right. Well, I, you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. And, you know, I try and do my bit. All of my nonprofits are, you know, nonpartisan, bipartisan. Right. That they, you know, I'm, I, I could care less if somebody wants to, help the homeless let's help the homeless you know leave your politics and uh, somewhere else i think that's that's good because you, you you have an organization that ties in with the homeless and we're going to get to that one in just a second i there's two more that i just want to very briefly touch on i want the, the first star and and aspire real quick let's start with the first star uh tell us a little bit about that one how that started yeah so um, you, you sort of get the pattern in yeah. the naming of my charity, Starlight, Starbright, First Star I See Tonight. Anyway, so after Starbright, somebody gave me the um, uh, survey that UNICEF does okay. of the developed nations. And it, they're measuring the developed nations. I think there are around 23 of them. They're, so it's like Western Europe and North America, Japan, uh, Australia and so forth. And they're measuring them by the welfare of their children. And of the 23, the United States ranks dead last. And then you read in the appendix that we spend more money on children's welfare than any other nation per capita. I thought, well, this doesn't compute. I've met a whole ton of Americans. I don't know anyone who ha hates children. Why is the situation of children in this country so subpar? Like, why do they do it better in Norway or Australia or somewhere? Come on, we're, we're Americans, we should fix this. So I started, I, I believe in doing a lot of research and I decided the most marginalized group of American children were foster kids. So by definition, these are children, zero to 18 years old, okay 
whose family has done such a poor job, they've either abused them or neglected them, that the state, that, that's us, through our judges, judiciary, you know, social welfare, whatever, the kids have been removed from the birth family and placed with strangers. They've either been placed with loving foster parents or they've been placed uh, with subpar foster parents who are just doing it for the money, or worse, they've been put into a uh, institutional care. So it's like an orphanage. Right. And when you look at the stats, so of all Americans, roughly um, 45% go to college. Um, and of foster kids, it's 9%. So I thought, well, this is no good. Really? And also all Americans, roughly two thirds to three quarters graduate high school. Foster kids, it's only half that. So I thought, well, this is crazy, isn't it? If anyone ought to go to college, it would be kids who have no functional family. Number one, they would have somewhere to live for an extra four years, wouldn't they? Right. And secondly, they would meet a whole better class of people and, and they pal around and ha they'd have, you know, if you were on a social a skills, campus, education. Yeah. And, and, and sports yeah. and self-discipline and the whole thing. So this went round and round in my mind and research showed me there's nobody doing anything about getting foster kids into college. And of course it's not, I knew intuitively, you can't just sort of tell them you should go to college. It's not even enough to say, and I can raise money. So you'll have a scholarship because if they don't get ready in high school, right. they won't thrive in college. Right. They won't be ready. So I developed this idea and I went and got myself a meeting with the chancellor of UCLA, the university. Okay. And to this day, Gene Block thinks I went and met with him because I thought it was a really great university, which is true, except I really went because I lived just down the road from UCLA and it was closest. <laughs> and I thought, well, why would I go to a distant one? I might as well start next door. <laughs> so I said to him, I would like you to agree to let us, and it'll be a new 501c3, we want to house, educate, and encourage high school aged foster kids, grades nine through 12, the high school period right. on your campus, right in the middle of your campus, please say yes. And it was one of those remarkable meetings. He is a remarkable man. I came out of his office two hours later and he had said yes. And he shook my hand. We raised money. We piloted in 2012, 2013 with 30 um, uh, ninth graders. And um, we now have 16 of these academies in the United States, oh, wow. each at a big wow. university, and two in the United Kingdom. So that's 18. You heard me say 45% of Americans go to college, right. all yeah. Americans, and uh, it's only 9% of foster kids. If you average the last three years across the 16 academies, we got 87%. Wow of our foster kids into college or rather we didn't get them into college. They got themselves into college. We say to them, it's a ladder. If you fall off the ladder during high school, we're going to put you back on the ladder. But in the end, you're the only one who's going to move your feet up the rungs. And when you get to the top, then there's another ladder that's called use the four years of college, learn a skill, learn a profession so that you can get a great job um, after college. Uh, the 87% is about 50-50 between those who go to four years to get a bachelor's at a university and those who go to community college, two-year course to get an associate's. So that's what First Star is. It's, it's beautiful just how these all uh, – it gives me goosebumps in, the, in just hearing that. And as a, as a registered high school teacher, that was the biggest thing, I, I, just seeing kids that were going in and out of the system. And I dealt with the troubled kids because I was the in-school suspension teacher. They're good kids. They just either didn't have discipline at home or nobody was listening to them or they, they slipped through the through the cracks and they didn't think they were going to go anywhere. And, and it was pull them aside, give them that confidence that they need because, they're, they're, you know, and the fact that that's what you guys are doing is, is, is amazing. I want to talk about Aspire real quick. Academy for Social Purpose 
and responsible entertainment. What I see responsible entertainment that really jumps out at me. What does that mean? So I realized that the only undergraduates in a university who get taught videography are in the film school. Okay. You're either a film major and you learn how to make a little film yeah. or you're an engineer or a dancer or an English lit major or a, you know, pre-med and you don't learn generally how to make a little film. But I thought to myself, young people are so socially ambitious. They would like to make the world a better place. We teach them how to make a PowerPoint, how to maybe write a, you know, Microsoft Word article. Why are we not teaching them to make a little film? It's so much more powerful than a PowerPoint and it's a teachable skill. Right. I've taught it. And I was teaching it to the foster kids in First Star. So I thought, let me go back to UCLA and ask them if we can pilot. Let's open up a filmmaking program where we will not teach it in the film school and we will not admit film students. They're already getting it and then some. But let's teach it to those engineers and, and architects and you know all these other categories of undergraduates Let's teach them how to make a film to pursue and persuade and raise money with and, and, and bring people on board and put their team, their crew together. Um, let's teach them how to do that. How do you write it? How do you shoot it? And how do you edit it? And then what do you do with it? So it has a great deal to do with social media and so forth. Okay. Aspire has branched into all sorts of other areas now. Um, uh, but, it, but primarily, that's it. It's um, using media as a teachable skill to make the world a better place. Love it. And it's so needed nowadays, especially with all of these social media platforms, different platforms that are out there. So uh, it's, it's so needed. All right. This is the next one I want to talk about. And this is this is the one that really kind of was very eye opening to me. Um, everyone deserves a roof. Uh, this is this is you know looking at it. I'm on the website right now, and and if you don't get choked up looking at this, folks, then I, I question just how human you are uh, on this. It's 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 uh, it's at first it's it's kind of sad to see, but then you see what this organization is doing, and it warms your heart. So what what is this organization? Everyone deserves a roof. What does that mean, and, and what are you providing? So where it comes from is this. I realized I was scared of homeless people in the street. Okay. Um, like I come out of a restaurant or a cafe or something, and suddenly, you know, there's some guy who's bigger than me, and he's like in my face, and he's got his hand out, and, you know, what, what do I do, and is this safe, and so on and so forth. And I was not proud of being scared of people who by definition clearly didn't have two nickels to rub together. So I forced myself to interview 65 homeless people. I went out on the weekends on my bicycle and I would go up to a homeless person found randomly on the street. And I would say, hi, my name's Peter. Can I ask you some questions? They all said yes. And it was a complete eye opener. I thought, first of all, they're all guys. They're not all guys. They're 45% female in the census, homeless folk. Secondly, I thought most of them will be mentally ill. Wrong. It's about 15% are mentally ill. The others are just having a tough life, the 85%. Then I thought um, they're all going to be adults. I'd never seen previously a homeless child. I thought, well, you know, if a child was homeless, surely Child Protective Services, you know, DCFS, whoever, they'd pick them up. No, they don't. Um, the fact of being homeless is not a reason for a parent to lose custody of their child. And maybe that's the right thing. I mean, if they're being neglected, they would do something. Right. But if it's a mom who was a single mom and was a waitress and now with you know, COVID, the restaurant closed and suddenly she's destitute with a kid, uh, what is she supposed to do? And that child is definitively homeless. The epiphany for me, the moment, you know, of empathy 
in the end was an old lady. I said, and um, I, I always ask two questions. Where do you get money? And where do you go to sleep at night? When I asked this old lady, where do you go and sleep at night? She said, come, I'll show you. And she took me kind of by the sleeve and led me onto the Caltrans land next to the 405 freeway. And there was the biggest cardboard box you ever saw in your life. And it had been raining and it was disgusting. And it had a piece of blue plastic over part of the top, but not the whole top. And it was damp and smelly. And she said, this is where I sleep. And I looked at her and I thought, this is a woman in her 60s or 70s um, sleeping in a cardboard box. On the side of the box, it said Sub-Zero. And I thought, well, I'll be damned. I have a Sub-Zero refrigerator. This old lady got the cardboard box that the refrigerators come in. What is wrong with this picture? You know? We're a, a, a wealthy, even with all the recession and COVID and this and that, we're, we're a wealthy nation. We're, we're not, you know, this is not some, uh, you know, destitute nation. And yet we have people who can't afford a roof. Right. So my first thought was, well, I know how to raise money. I'll build a, a, a hostel or homeless shelter for, with 100 beds. So I got an architect. I got a space planner. I got a budgeter. Turns out to build a building with 100 beds is $5 million in, in, in LA. So I said, oh, so 100 beds, $5 million, take two zeros off of 5 million. Ah, oh, $50,000 per bed that you generate. And I, I, I had a look and I saw, oh, this at least, this is before COVID, 60,000 homeless folk who are unhoused in the county of LA. 60,000 times 50,000 is $3 billion. I have no idea how you raise $3 billion. And there will never be, you know, taxpayer will or political will to spend $3 billion on a bunch of homeless people to get them apartments or hostels. Right. So I thought, ah, oh, okay, well, one of the things you, you learn as a film producer is you never give up. Right. You're always trying. Oh, the door was locked. Go around the back, see if it's open. So I thought, I wonder what is the absolute best we could do with 600 bucks a head. I'm sure it won't be as good as a nice fluffy bed in a building, but maybe it would be a whole heck of a lot better than a damp cardboard box on a rainy night. Okay. So I tried, I imagined this thing in the daytime, it'll kind of be like a huge shopping cart. You'll push it along, but at night you put the brake on and you let the front and the back down. And now it's a seven foot long cot um, with some kind of enclosure. It has to have a, a, a door and windows and so on and so forth. And I, I mean, I have the spatial design skills of a, of a newt. I mean, I couldn't draw this thing to save my life. So I thought, well, where do they design three-dimensional stuff? So I found there's a place in Pasadena called the Pasadena Art Center College of Design, where they've got three or 400 students who are learning how to design refrigerators and automobiles and, you know, stuff that Amazon sends you in a box. Right. So I went out there, I met with the dean, Dean Korshek, and I said, if I put up I don't know, what's a good prize for a competition? $1,000. If I put up $1,000, can we have a competition open to all your undergraduates in little teams and they will design this thing? And I described it to him. He said, of course we can do that. And he said, what do you want to call it? And I said, I don't know. What should we call it? And he said, I don't know what we should call it. What do you want to call it? And I said, well, everyone deserves a roof, E-D-A-R, <laughs> It's an EDAR. So we had a name before we had a design. <laughs> so they had the competition. I've been working with the the, the, the designer who won the, the prize yeah. ever since, yeah. Eric Lindemann. We got a fabrication. He, he built it out of cardboard like an eighth size or is it a six? It's called a maquette. Yeah, right. It's like, like a little thing made out of cardboard, but it folded up and unfolded. So we took that to a fabrication shop where they make most of Los Angeles shopping carts. And we said, um, 
build a life-size one of these out of metal. We went through eight prototypes. We got a canvas shop. Uh, we got the mattresses made and we tested them. We threw them down a flight of stairs. We pointed fire hoses at them and we got it right. We're actually now, um, we're on the Mark II. Um, I decided um, before we go um, building more of them, um, we should actually ask the users how we can make it better. So we did a, I don't think anyone has ever asked homeless folk how something can be made better for them. Uh, but we did ask them and we videotaped it and we wrote down all the answers and we perfected the design even more. And it's weird that we're talking today, uh, the 30th of March, 2021. Today, okay. we have the first 78 off the production line of the Mark II EDARs. They are, it's a quarter to two in the afternoon here. Uh, I haven't spoken to the warehouse, but allegedly, and I'll knock it on wood here, uh, <laughs> they should have received the 78 on a 40-foot container truck uh, at 10.30 this morning. God knows if they got them, was the loading dock higher or right, lower right. than the back of the truck? I <laughs> was up half the night worrying about all the logistics. So we're going to start giving them away. They're free to the end user. These people don't have any money. Yeah. Anyone can sponsor an EDAR. I would love it if your listeners, our listeners, went on EDAR.org, E-D-A-R. Remember, everyone deserves a roof.org. Uh, you can donate 600 bucks, and we will give one to a homeless person. If you know a homeless person, you can buy an EDAR, we'll send it to you, you know, plus freight. Yeah. Uh, and you can give it to the homeless person. We do think it's better if the unhoused folk are um, uh, working with either a mission, you know, there are Christian missions, mm. um, union rescue mission, places like that, or a soup kitchen, anything a bit organized where they got some social workers, because we have no clue how to do the social work side. Right. So it's kind of better to give them to the unhoused people through an organization, a charity of some kind. But either way, um, so it's sort of an experiment. It is absolutely not as good as giving everybody an apartment, here are your keys, but that would cost, you know, billions and billions and billions of dollars. We have to do something right. about this unhoused problem that's in on and around us. I think, you know, a chain is only as strong as the weakest link. What is the weakest link in our society? It's that guy or woman or child living under the bridge over there. Yeah. I think they kind of define what's the worst about us. And, you know, what's that old saying? Better to light a single candle than curse the gathering darkness. Well, EDAR is many single candles, 78, hopefully, in the warehouse yeah. as of this morning. And I hope we can do thousands of these things. Um, it is much better for homeowners to have an EDAR outside your store or whatever, or your house. Um, first of all, they have wheels on them. They can go away. Um, the, the thing that, um, you know, civilians don't like about unhoused people uh, living somewhere close to where they live or where they work or the restaurant, whatever it is, um, is, you know, 20 guys under a bridge in crappy cardboard boxes. It's very difficult to move them. And, um, you know, it's just ugly. Yeah. These are spick and span. You as an ex um, military guy and your listeners, yes. you'll love EDOS. They're, they're, they're khaki colored, they're spick and span. Quite a lot of the unhoused veterans uh, are our clients, and um, they love them. And you can tell who is has been in the military because their EDARs are pristine. Right. You know, they're, <laughs> it's like not, nothing out of place. But sometimes it's really sweet. We had somebody the other day saying, this is my first step on the American dream and uh, it, we call them the hobo condo. And um, <laughs> we have an old lady who is my personal favorite like called that. Brenda. Uh, and she has a welcome mat in front of the entrance flap. Oh, no, and no. Um, and they're, they're very mobile. We say to the people, if anyone yells at you, whether it's law enforcement or 
a neighbor, whatever, apologize. It folds up into the day mode in like 20 seconds. Just apologize as you're walking away. Go find somewhere else. Yeah. So um, I think it's not on a scale of 10 if um, uh, an apartment is a 10 and a zero would be that damp cardboard box on a rainy night. We're a five on a good day. Wow. Maybe we're a four on a bad day, but we're a hell of a lot better you're, than the damp you're, box. You're better than a, than a damp box. And, and the fact that you're willing to put yourself out there like that to help so many people, you know, some of you know, my son, <clears throat> quick little story that talks about home. my son comes in one day from this was years ago and says, dad, this weekend, I want to go feed the homeless. Uh, okay just ran up so we made peanut butter jelly sandwiches we we took a bunch of water out and on that weekend we we walked this was downtown phoenix arizona and and it was 110 degrees outside and we walked out and we handed out several cases of uh of water this would have been great for a lot of those those uh people uh especially in the, if you're out in the desert uh and whatnot so folks you're already listening to the show edar.org open up another browser make a donation today get involved check out everything that peter's doing we'll have all of his uh information as well as the uh, organizations that he has uh, founded that uh, way if you like what you're hearing and you want to play a part or make a donation you can do so peter i got one more question for you before we let you go you're on the show called the decision hour and you have made a plethora of decisions over over the years and, and every single day. But name a time in your life where your feet were on the line and you had to make that one decision. What was that decision and what was the atmosphere like for you at that time? I think I could have done much better as a film producer. I've made 26 films, so it's not nothing. But if I had done no philanthropy, no Starlight, Starbright, Edar, Aspire, I could have made more films so I'd have more money. But what I've come to realize is that, sure, it's better to have a bit of money and to have a somewhere to live and, you know, um, have vacations and all that kind of thing. It's not the most important thing. What I realize is the most important thing is being a parent and raising my four kids well and the second most important thing, but it's part of the first thing, is trying every day and in every way to make the world a better place with whatever skills God gave you. Use them and not just to make money, but to help other people to live their best life. And what I realize is, I guess it's what we call legacy. How are we defined? I found myself commiserating with someone who has a relative last week who died of COVID. And I said to her, the thing that's given me comfort for many years is realizing that all of us actually live two separate lives. There's the life where we're born, we live, we do, and eventually we die. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. But there is an entirely separate life that is just as real. And it is the sum total of all of the effect that we had on other people. Did you raise your kids well? Do you see your kids do things and you think, oh, I taught him that. She's doing that because we did that thing together, that volunteering thing. If you cherish the, the effect that you have on other people through charity, through, in your case, teaching, through the way you raise your kids, through any kind of nonprofit volunteering, whatever it is at the church, um, that is a whole life. And the interesting thing about it is it never ends because you lifted up people, those people lifted up other people because that's part of what you taught them. And in the end, it's a huge impact that you've had on the world and it never ends. You, you, your first life can die. You can die. That's the end of you. You know, everybody's sad. But then they look around them, hopefully in the memorial service, and they think, damn, there's an awful lot of people that have benefited and I'm one of them. And look at all these other people and they're all living lives that are a little bit better because this person lived. 
I think that second life is very, very important. And I think if we all did it a little bit every day, I think our world would be better. And that would be a very good thing. God bless you, Peter. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day. And that was an amazing and incredible decision hour moment. Thank you very much. Folks, that's all the time that we have today. We're going to make sure we get all this uh, Peter's information uh, out there. Make sure you check out our, our parent network, Heroes Media Group. If you're looking to become part of the HMG family, go to heroesmediagroup.com. Until next time, you've been listening to The Decision Hour.